I learned the language. As I came back to myself, I glanced at Sola, who had witnessed this encounter, and I was surprised to note a strange expression upon her usually expressionless countenance. What her thoughts were I did not know, for as yet I had learned but little of the Martian tongue, enough only to suffice for my daily needs. As I reached the doorway of our building, a strange surprise awaited me. A warrior approached, bearing the arms, ornaments, and full accoutrements of his kind. These presented me with a few unintelligible words, and bearing at once respectful and menacing. Later, Sola, with the aid of several of the other women, remodeled the trappings to fit my lesser proportions, and after they completed the work, I went about garbed in all the panoply of war. From then on, Sola instructed me in the mysteries of the various weapons, and with the Martian young I spent several hours each day practicing upon the plaza. I was not yet proficient with all the weapons, but my great familiarity with similar earthly weapons made me an unusually apt pupil, and I progressed in a very satisfactory manner. The training of myself and the young Martians was conducted solely by the women, who not only attended to the education of the young in the arts of individual defense and offense, but are also the artisans who produce every manufactured article wrought by the green Martians. They make the powder, the cartridges, the firearms. In fact, everything of value is produced by the females. In time of actual warfare, they form a part of the reserves, and when the necessity arises, fight with even greater intelligence and ferocity than the men. The men are trained in the higher branches of the art of war, in strategy and the maneuvering of large bodies of troops. They make the laws as they are needed, a new law for each emergency. They are unfettered by precedented in the administration of justice. Customs have been handed down by ages of repetition, but the punishment for ignoring a custom is a matter for individual treatment by a jury of the culprit's peers. And I may say that justice seldom misses fire. It seems rather to rule in inverse ratio to the ascendancy of law. In one respect, at least, the Martians are happy people they have no lawyers. I did not see the prisoner again for several days subsequent to our first encounter, and then only to catch a fleeting glimpse of her as she was being conducted to the great audience chamber, where I had had my first meeting with Lord Quaspitamel. I could not but note the unnecessary harshness and brutality with which her guards treated her so different from the almost maternal kindliness which Sola manifested towards me, and the respectful attitude of the few green Martians who took the trouble to notice me at all. I had observed on the two occasions when I had seen her that the prisoner exchanged words with her guards, and this convinced me that they spoke, or at least could make themselves understood, by a common language. With this added incentive, I nearly drove Sola distracted by my importunities to hasten on my education, and within a few more days I had mastered the Martian tongue sufficiently well to enable me to carry on a passable conversation and to fully understand practically all that I heard. At this time, our sleeping quarters were occupied by three or four females and a couple of recently hatched young beside Sola and her youthful ward, myself and Woola the Hound. After they had retired for the night, it was customary for the adults to carry on a desultory conversation for a short time before lapsing into sleep. And now that I could understand their language, I was always a keen listener, although I never proffered any remarks myself. On the night following the prisoner's visit to the audience chamber, the conversation finally fell upon this subject, and I was all ears on the instant. 
I had feared to question Sola relative to the, to the beautiful captive, as I could not but recall the strange expression I had noted upon her face after my first encounter with the prisoner. That it denoted jealousy I could not say, and yet, judging all things by mundane standards, as I still did, I felt safer to affect indifference in the matter until I learned more surely Sola's attitude toward the object of my solicitude. Sarkoja, one of the older women who shared our domicile, had been present at the audience as one of the captive's guards, and it was toward her the question turned. When, asked one of the woman, women, will we enjoy the death throes of the Red One? Or does Lorquas Potmel Jed intend holding her for ransom? They have decided to carry her with us back to Thark and exhibit her last agonies at the great games before Thal Hyges, replied Sarkjoka. What will be the manner of her going out? inquired Sola. She is very small and very beautiful. I had hoped they would hold her for ransom. Sarkoja and the other women grunted angrily at this evidence of weakness on the part of Sola. It is sad, Sola, that you were not born a million years ago, snapped Sarkoja. When all the hollows of the land were filled with water, and the people were as soft as the stuff they sailed upon. In our day, we have progressed to a point where such sentiments mark weakness and atavism. It will not be well for you to permit Tars Tarkas to learn that you hold such degenerate sentiments, as I doubt that he would care to entrust such as you with the grave responsibilities of maternity. I see nothing wrong with my expression of interest in this red woman, retorted Sola. She has never harmed us, nor would she should we have fallen into her hands. It is only the men of her kind who wore upon us, and I have ever thought that their attitude towards us is but a reflection of ours toward them. They live at peace with all their fellows, except when duty calls upon them to make war, while we are at peace with none, forever warring among our own kind as well as upon the red men, and even in our own communities the individuals fight amongst themselves. Oh, it is one continual, awful period of bloodshed from the time we break the shell until we gladly embrace the bosom of the river of mystery, the dark and ancient Is, which carries us to an unknown, but at least no more frightful and terrible existence. Fortunate indeed is he who meets his end in an early death. Say what you please to Tars Tarkas, he can mete out no worse fate to me than a continuation of the horrible existence we are forced to lead in this life. This wild outbreak on the part of Sola so greatly surprised and shocked the other women that after a few words, general reprimand, they all lapsed into silence and were soon asleep. One thing the episode had accomplished was to assure me of Sola's friendliness towards the poor girl, and also to convince me that I had been extremely fortunate in falling into her hands rather than those of some of the other females. I knew that she was fond of me, and now that I had discovered that she hated cruelty and barbarity, I was confident that I could depend upon her to aid me and the girl captive to escape. Provided, of course, that such a thing was within the range of possibilities. I did not even know that there were any better conditions to escape to. But I was more than willing to take my chances among people fashioned after my own mold rather than to remain longer among the hideous and bloodthirsty green men of Mars. But where to go, and how, was as much of a puzzle to me as the age-old search for the spring of eternal life has been to earthly men since the beginning of time. I decided that at the first opportunity, I would take Sola into my confidence and openly ask her to aid me. And with this resolution strong upon me, I turned among my silks and furs and slept the dreamless and refreshing sleep of Mars. <clears throat> 
champion and chief. Early the next morning, I was a steer. Considerable freedom was allowed me, as Sola had informed me that so long as I did not attempt to leave the city, I was free to go and come as I pleased. She had warned me, however, against venturing forth unarmed, as this city, like all other deserted metropolises of an ancient Martian civilization, was peopled by the great white apes of my second day's adventure. In advising me that I must not leave the boundaries of the city, Sola had explained that Wula would prevent this anyway should I attempt it, and she warned me most urgently not to arouse his fierce nature by ignoring his warnings should I venture too close to the forbidden territory. His nature was such, she said, that he would bring me back into the city, dead or alive, should I persist in opposing him. Preferably dead, she added. On this morning, I had chosen a new street to explore when suddenly I found myself at the limits of the city. Before me were low hills, pierced by narrow and inviting ravines. I longed to explore the country before me, and like the pioneer stock from which I sprang, to view what the landscape beyond the encircling hills might disclose from the summits which shut out my view. It also occurred to me that this would prove an excellent opportunity to test the qualities of Wula. I was convinced that the brute loved me. I had seen more evidences of affection in him than any other Martian animal, man or beast, and I was sure that gratitude for the acts that had twice saved his life would more than outweigh his loyalty to the duty imposed upon him by cruel and loveless masters. As I approached the boundary line, Wula ran anxiously before me and thrust his body against my legs. His expression was pleading rather than ferocious. Nor did he bear his great tusks or utter his fearful guttural warnings. Denied the friendship and companionship of my kind, I had developed considerable affection for Wula and Sola for the normal earthly man must have some outlet for his natural affections, and so I decided upon an appeal to a like instinct in this great brute, sure that I would not be disappointed. I had never petted nor fondled him, but now I sat upon the ground, and putting my arms around his heavy neck, I stroked and coaxed him. Talking in my newly acquired Martian tongue, as I would have to my hound at home, as I would have talked to any other friend among the lower animals. His response to my manifestation of affection was remarkable to a degree. He stretched his great mouth to its full width, bearing his entire expanse of his upper rows of tusks and wrinkling his snout until his great eyes were almost hidden in the folds of flesh. If you have ever seen a collie smile, you may have some idea of Wula's facial distortion. He threw himself upon his back and fairly wallowed at my feet, jumped up and sprang upon me, rolling me upon the ground by his great weight, and then wriggling and squirming around, me like a playful puppy, presenting its back for the petting it craves. I could not resist the ludicrousness of the spectacle, and holding my sides, I rocked back and forth in the first laughter which had passed my lips in many days. The first, in fact, since the morning Powell had left camp, when his horse, long unused, had per precipitately and unexpectedly bucked him off head foremost into a pot of frijoles. My laughter frightened Wula. His antics ceased and he crawled pitifully toward me, poking his hug ugly head far into my lap. And then I remembered what laughter signified on Mars. Torture, suffering, death. Quieting myself, I rubbed the poor fellow's head and back, talked to him for a few minutes, and then, in an authoritative tone, commanded him to follow me and a rising started for the hills. 
There was no further question of authority between us. Wula was my devoted slave from that moment hence, and I his only and undisputed master. My walk to the hills occupied but a few minutes, and I found nothing of particular interest to reward me. Numerous brilliantly colored and strangely formed wild flowers dotted the ravines, and from the summit of the first hill, I saw still other hills stretching off toward the north and rising, one range above another, until lost in mountains of quite respectable dimensions. Though I afterward found that only a few peaks on all Mars exceed 4,000 feet in height, the suggestion of magnitude was merely relative. My morning's walk had been large with importance to me, for it had resulted in a perfect understanding with Wula, upon whom Tars Tarkas relied for my safekeeping. I now knew that while theoretically a prisoner, prisoner, I was virtually free, and I hastened to regain the city limits before the defection of Wula could be discovered by his erstwhile masters. The adventure decided me never again to leave the limits of my prescribed stamping grounds until I was ready to venture forth for good and all, as it would certainly result in a curtailment of my liberties, as well as the probable death of Wula. Were we to be discovered? On regaining the plaza, I had my third glimpse of the captive girl. She was standing with her guards before the entrance to the audience chamber, and as, as I approached, she gave me one haughty glance and turned her back full upon me. The act was so womanly, so earthly womanly, that though it stung my pride, it also warmed my heart with a feeling of companionship. It was good to know that someone else on Mars beside myself had human instincts, of a civilized order, even though the manifestation of them was so painful and mortifying. Had a green Martian woman desired to show dislike or contempt, she would in all likelihood have done it with a sword thrust or a movement of her trigger finger. But as their sentiments are mostly atrophied, it would have required a serious injury to have aroused such passions in them Sola, let me add, was an exception. I never saw her perform a cruel or uncouth act, or fail in uniform kindliness and good nature. She was indeed, as her fellow Martian had said, <clears throat> of her an atavism a dear and precious reversion to a former type of loved and loving ancestor. Seeing that the prisoner seemed the center of attraction, I halted to view the proceedings. I had not long to wait, for presently Lord Quasputmel and his retinue of chieftains approached the building, and signing the guards to follow with the prisoner entered the audience chamber. Realizing that I was somewhat favored character, and also convinced that the warriors did not know of my proficiency in their language, as I had pled with Sola to keep this a secret, on the grounds that I did not wish to be forced to talk with the men until I had perfectly mastered the Martian tongue. I chanced an attempt to enter the audience chamber and listen to the proceedings. The council squatted on the steps of the rostrum, while below them stood the prisoner and her two guards. I saw that one of the women was Sarkoja, and thus understood how she had been present at the hearing of the preceding day, the results of which she had reported to the occupants of our dormitory last night. Her attitude toward the captain captive was most harsh and brutal. When she held her, she sunk her rudimentary nails into the poor girl's flesh or twisted her arm in a most painful manner. When it was necessary to move from one spot to another, she either jerked her roughly or pushed her headlong before her. She seemed to be venting upon this poor defenseless creature all the hatred, cruelty, ferocity, and spite of her 900 years 
backed by unguessable ages of fierce and brutal ancestors. The other woman was less cruel because she was entirely indifferent. If the prisoner had been left to her alone, and fortunately she was at night, she would have received no harsh treatment, nor by the same token would she have received any attention at all. As Lorquas Putmel raised his eyes to address the prisoner, they fell on me and he turned to Tars Tarkas with a word and gesture of impatience. Tars Tarkas made some reply which I could not catch, but which caused Lorquas Putmel to smile, after which they paid no further attention to me. What is your name? asked Lorquas Putmel, addressing the prisoner. Deja Thoris. Daughter of Mors Kajak of Helium. And the nature of your expedition, he continued. It was a purely scientific research party sent out by my father's father, the Jeddak of Helium, to rechart the air currents and to take atmospheric density tests, replied the fair prisoner. In a low, well-modulated voice, we were unprepared for battle, she continued, as we were on a peaceful mission, as our banners and the colors of our craft denoted. The work we were doing was as much in your interest as in ours, for you know full well that were it not for our labors, the fruits of our scientific operations, there would not be enough air or water on Mars to support a single human life. For ages we have maintained the air and water supply at practically the same point without an appreciable loss, and we have done this in the face of brutal and ignorant interference of you green men. Why, oh why, will you not learn to live in amity with your fellows? Must you ever go down the ages to your final extinction but little above the plane of the dumb brutes that serve you? A people without written language, without art, without homes, without love, the victims of eons of horrible community idea, owning everything in common, even to your women and children, has resulted in your owning nothing in common. You hate each other as you hate all else except yourselves. Come back to the ways of our common ancestors. Come back to the light of kindliness and fellowship. The way is open to you. You will find the hands of the red men outstretched to aid you. Together we may do still more to regenerate our dying planet. The granddaughter of the greatest and mightiest of the red Jeddaks has asked you, will you come? Lorquas Potmel and the warrior sat looking silently and intently at the young woman for several moments after she had ceased speaking. What was passing in their minds, no man may know. But that they were moved, I truly believe. And if one man high among them had been strong enough to rise above custom, that moment would have marked a new and mighty era for Mars. I saw Tars Tarkas rise to speak, and on his face was such an expression as I had never seen upon the countenance of a green Martian warrior. It bespoke an inward and mighty battle with self, with heredity, with age-old custom, and as he opened his mouth to speak, a look almost benightly of kindliness momentarily lighted up his fierce and terrible countenance. What words of moment were to have fallen from his lips were never spoken, as just then a young warrior, evidently sensing the trend of thought among the older men, leaped down from the steps of the rostrum and striking the frail, frail captive a powerful blow across the face which felled her to the floor, placed his foot upon her prostrate form, and turning outward, the assembled council broke into peals of horrid, mirthless laughter. For an instant, I thought Tars Tarkas would strike him dead, nor did the aspect of Lors Potmel augur any 
too favorably for the brute. With the mood past, their old selves reasserted their ascendancy, and they smiled. It was portentous, however, that they did not laugh aloud, for the brute's act constituted a side-splitting witticism according to the ethics which rule green Martian humor. That I have taken moments to write down a part of what occurred as that blow fell does not signify that I remained inactive for any length of time. I think I must have sensed something of what was coming, for I realize now that I was crouched as for a spring as I saw the blow aimed at her beautiful upturned pleading face, and ere the hand descended I was halfway across the hall. Scarcely had his hideous laugh rang out but once when I was upon him. The brute was twelve feet in height and armed to the teeth, but I believe that I could have accounted for the whole room full in the terrific intensity of my rage. Springing upward, I struck him full in the face as he turned at my warning cry, and then as he drew his short sword, I drew mine and sprang up again upon his breast. Hooking one leg over the butt of his pistol and grasping one of his huge tusks with my left hand while I delivered blow after blow upon his enormous chest. He could not use his short sword to advantage because I was too close to him, nor could he draw his pistol, which he attempted to do in direct opposition to Martian custom which says that you may not fight a fellow warrior in private combat with any other than the weapon with which you are attacked. In fact, he could do nothing but make a wild and futile attempt to dislodge me. With all his immense bulk, he was little, if any, stronger than I, and it was but the matter of a moment or two before he sank, bleeding and lifeless, to the floor. Deja Thoris had raised herself upon one elbow and was watching the battle with wide, staring eyes. When I had regained my feet, I raised her in my arms and bore her to one of the benches at the side of the room. Again, no Martian interfered with me, and tearing a piece of silk from my cape, I endeavored to staunch the flow of blood from her nostrils. I was soon successful, as her injuries amounted to little more than an ordinary nosebleed, and when she could speak, she placed her hand upon my arm, and looking up into my eyes, said, Why did you do it? You who refused me even friendly recognition, in the first hour of my peril, and now you risk your life and kill one of your companions for my sake? I cannot understand. What strange manner of man are you, that you consort with the green men, though your form is that of my race, while your color is little darker than that of a white ape? Tell me, are you human, or are you more than human? It is a strange tale, I replied, too long to attempt to tell you now, and one which I so much doubt the credibility of myself that I fear to hope that others will believe it. Suffice it for the present that I am your friend, and so far as our captors will permit, your protector and your servant. Then you too are a prisoner? But why then those arms and the regalia of Tharkian chieftain? What is your name? Where your country? Yes, Deja Thoris, I too am a prisoner. My name is John Carter, and I claim Virginia, one of the United States of America, Earth as my home. But why I am permitted to wear arms I do not know, nor was I aware that my regalia was that of a chieftain. We were interrupted at this juncture by the approach of one of the warriors bearing arms, accoutrements, and ornaments. And in a flash, one of her questions was answered, and a puzzle cleared up for me. I saw that the body of my dead antagonist had been stripped, 
and I read in the menacing yet respectful attitude of the warrior who had brought me these trophies of the kill, the same demeanor as that evidenced by the other one who had brought me my original equipment. And now for the first time I realized that my blow on the occasion of my first battle in the audience chamber had resulted in the death of my adversary. <clears throat> the reason for the whole attitude displayed toward me was now apparent. I had won my spurs, so to speak, and in the crude justice which always marks Martian dealings, and which among other things has caused me to call her the planet of paradoxes, I was accorded the honors due a conqueror, the trappings and the position of the man I killed. In truth, I was a Martian chieftain, and this I learned later was the cause of my great freedom and my toleration in this audience chamber. As I had turned to receive the dead warrior's chattels, I had noticed that Tars Tarkas and several others had pushed forward toward us, and the eyes of the former rested upon me in the most quizzical manner. Finally, he addressed me. You speak the tongue of Barsoom quite readily for one who was deaf and dumb to us a few short days ago. Where did you learn it, John Carter? You yourself are responsible, Tars Tarkas, I reply, in that you furnished me with an instructress of remarkable ability. I have to thank Sola for my learning. She has done well, he answered, but your education in other respects needs considerable polish. Do you know what your unprecedented, unprecedented temerity would have cost you had you failed to kill either of the two chieftains whose medal you now wear? I presume that one whom I had failed to kill would have killed me, I answered, smiling. No, you are wrong. Only in the last extremity of self-defense would a Martian warrior kill a prisoner. We like to save them for other purposes and his face bespoke possibilities that were not pleasant to dwell upon. But one thing can save you now, he continued. Should you, in recognition of your remarkable valor, ferocity, and prowess, be considered by Tal Hojus as worthy of his service, you may be taken into the community and become a full-fledged Tharki. Until we reach the headquarters of Tal Hajus, it is the will of Lorquis Potmel that you be accorded the respect your acts have earned you. You will be treated by us as a Tharkian chieftain, but you must not forget that every chief who ranks you is responsible for your safe delivery to our mighty and most ferocious ruler. I am done. I hear you, Tarstarkis, I answered. As you know, I am not of Barzoom. Your ways are not my ways, and I can only act in the future as I have in the past, in accordance with the dictates of my conscience and guided by the standards of mine own people. If you will leave me alone, I will go in peace, but if not, let the individual Barsoomians with whom I must deal either respect my rights as a stranger among you, or take whatever consequences may befall. Of one thing, let us be sure. Whatever may be your ultimate intentions toward this unfortunate young woman, whoever would offer her injury or insult in the future, must figure on making a full accounting to me. I understand that you belittle all sentiments of generosity and kindness, but I do not and I can convince your most doughty warrior that these characteristics are not incompatible with an ability to fight. Ordinarily, I am not given to long speeches, nor ever before had I descended to bombast, but I had guessed at the keynote which would strike an answering chord in the breasts of the Green Martians, nor was I wrong for my harangue evidently deeply impressed them, and their attitude, attitude toward me thereafter was still further respectful. 
Ars Tarkas himself seemed pleased with my reply, but his only comment was more or less enigmatical. And I think I know Tal Hodges, Jeddak of Thark. I now turned my attention to Dejah Thoris, and assisting her to her feet, I turned with her toward the exit, ignoring her hovering guardian harpies, as well as the inquiring glances of the chieftains. Was I not now a chieftain also? Well then, I would assume the responsibilities of one. They did not molest us, and so Dejah Thoris, Princess of Helium, and John Carter, Gentleman of Virginia, followed by the faithful Hula, passed through utter silence from the audience chamber of Lorquas Putmel, Jed among the Tharks of Barzoom. With Deja Thoris. As we reached the open, the two female guards who had been detailed to watch over Deja Thoris hurried up and made as though to assume custody of her once more. The poor child shrank against me, and I felt her two little hands fold tightly over my arm. Waving the women away, I informed them that Sola would attend the captive hereafter, and I further warned Sarkoja that any more of her cruel attentions bestowed upon Dejah Thoris would result in Sarkoja's sudden and painful demise. My threat was unfortunate and resulted in more harm than good to Dejah Thoris, for as I learned later, men do not kill women upon Mars, nor women men. So Sarkoja merely gave us an ugly look and departed to hatch up devil trees against us. I soon found Sola and explained to her that I wished her to guard Dejah Thoris as she had guarded me that I wished her to find other quarters where they would not be molested by Sarkoja, and finally informed her that I myself would take up my quarters among the men. Sola glanced at the accoutrements which were carried in my hand and slung across my shoulder. You are now a great chieftain, John Carter, she said, and I must do your bidding, though indeed I am glad to do it under any circumstances. The man whose medal you carry was young, but he was a great warrior, and had by his promotions and kills won his way close to the rank of Tars Tarkas, who, as you know, is second to Lorquas Potmau only. You are eleventh. There are but ten chieftains in this community who, who rank you in prowess. You would be first, John Carter, but you may only win that honor by the will of the entire council that Lorquas Putmel meet you in combat. Or should he attack you, you may kill him in self-defense and thus win first place. I laughed and changed the subject. I had no particular desire to kill Lorquas Putmel unless to be a Jed among the tar Tharks. I accompanied Sola and Dejah Thoris in a search for new quarters, which we found in a building nearer the audience chamber and of far more pretentious architecture than our former habitation. We also found in this building real sleeping apartments with ancient beds of highly wrought metal swinging from enormous gold chains, depending from the marble ceilings the decoration of the walls was most elaborate and unlike the frescoes in the other buildings I had examined, portrayed many human figures in the compositions. These were of people like myself and of a much lighter color than Dejah Thoris. They were clad in graceful flowing robes, highly or ornamented with metal and jewels and their luxuriant hair was of a beautiful golden and reddish bronze. The men were beardless, and only a few wore arms. The scenes depicted for the most part a fair-skinned, fair-haired people at play. 
Deja Thoris clasped her hands with an exclamation of rapture as she gazed upon these magnificent works of art, wrought by a people long extinct. Wasola, on the other hand, apparently did not see them. We decided to use this room on the second floor and overlooking the plaza for Deja Thoris and Sola, and another room adjoining and in the rear for the cooking and supplies, and then dispatched Sola to bring the bedding and such food and utensils as she might need, telling her that I would guard Deja Thoris until her return. As Sola departed, Deja Thoris turned to me with a faint smile. And where to then would your prisoner escape should you leave her? Unless it was to follow you and crave your protection, and ask your pardon for the cruel thoughts she has harbored against you these past few days. You are right, I answered. There is no escape for either of us unless we go together. I heard your challenge to the creature you call Tars Tarkas and I think I understand your position among these people. But what I cannot fathom is your statement that you are not of Barzoom. In the name of my first ancestor, then, she continued, where may you be from? You are like unto my people, and yet so unlike. You speak my language, and yet I heard you tell Tars Tarkas that you had but learned it recently. All Barsoomians speak the same tongue, from the ice clad south to the ice clad north, though their written languages differ. Only in the valley door, where the river Is empties into the lost sea of Chorus, is there supposed to be a different language spoken, and except in the legends of our ancestors, there is no record of a Barsoomian returning upon the river Is from the shores of Chorus in the valley of Dor. Do not tell me that you have it thus returned. They would kill you horribly anywhere upon the surface of Barzoom if that were the truth. Tell me it is not. Her eyes were filled with a strange, weird light. Her voice was pleading, and her little hands reached up upon my breast, were pressed against me as though to wring a denial from my heart. I do not know your customs, Deja Thoris, but in my own Virginia, a man does not lie to save himself. I am not of Dor. I have never seen the mysterious Is. The lost sea of Chorus is still lost as far as I'm concerned. Do you believe me? And then it struck me suddenly that I was very anxious that she should believe me. It was not that I feared the results which would follow a general belief that I had returned from the Barzumian heaven or hell, or whatever it was. Why was it then? Why should I care what she thought? I looked down at her, her beautiful face upturned and her wonderful eyes opening up the very depth of her soul. And as my eyes met hers, I knew why, and I shuddered. A similar wave of feeling seemed to stir her. She drew away from me with a sigh, and with her earnest, beautiful face turned up to mine, she whispered, I believe you, John Carter. I do not know what a gentleman is, nor have I ever heard of Virginia before, but on Barsoom no man lies. If he does not wish to speak the truth, he is silent. Where is this Virginia, your country, John Carter, she asked. And it seemed that this fair name of my fair land had never sounded more beautiful than as it fell from those perfect lips on that far gone day. I am of another world, I answered, the great planet Earth, which revolves about our common sun and next within the orbit, orbit of your Barsoom, which we know as Mars. How I came here I cannot tell you, for I do not know. But here I am, and since my presence has permitted me to serve Deja Thoris, I am glad that I am here. She gazed at me with troubled eyes, long and questioningly. 
that it was difficult to believe my statement I knew, nor could I hope that she would do so however much I craved her confidence and respect. I would much rather have told her anything of my antecedents, but no man could look into the depth of those eyes and refuse her slightest behest. Finally, she smiled, and rising, said, I shall have to believe, even though I cannot understand. I can readily perceive that you are not of the Barzoom of today. You are like us, yet different. But why should I trouble my poor head with such a problem when my heart tells me that I believe because I wish to believe? It was good logic, good earthly feminine logic. And if it satisfied her, I certainly could pick no flaws in it. As a matter of fact, it was about the only kind of logic that could be brought to bear upon my problem. We fell into a general conversation then, asking and answering many questions on each side. She was curious to learn of the customs of my people and displayed a remarkable knowledge of events on Earth. When I questioned her closely on this, seeming familiarity with earthly things, she laughed and cried out. Why, every school boy on Barsoom knows the geography and much concerning the flora and fauna, as well as the history of your planet fully, as well, of his, as, well as his own. Can we not see everything which takes place upon Earth, as you call it? Is it not hanging there in the heavens in plain sight? This baffled me, I must confess, fully as much as my statements had confounded her, and I told her so. She then explained in general the instruments her people had used and been perfecting for ages, which permit them to th throw upon a screen a perfect image of what is transpiring upon any planet and upon many of the stars. These pictures are so perfect in detail that when photographed and enlarged, objects no greater than a blade of grass may be distinctly recognized. I afterward, in Helium, saw many of these pictures, as well as the instruments which produced them. If then you are so familiar with earthly things, I asked, why is it that you do not recognize me as identical with the inhabitants of that planet? She smiled again, as one might in bored indulgence of a questioning child. Because, John Carter, she replied, nearly every planet and star having atmospheric conditions at all approaching those of Barzoom shows forms of animal life almost identical with you and me. And further, Earthmen, almost without exception, cover their bodies with strange, unsightly pieces of cloth and their heads with hideous contraptions, the purpose of which we have been unable to conceive. While you, when found by the Tharkian warriors, were entirely undisfigured and unadorned. The fact that you wore no ornaments is a strong proof of your unbarsoomian origin, while the absence of grotesque coverings might cause a doubt as to your earthliness. I then narrated the details of my de departure from the earth, explaining that my body there lay fully clothed in all the, to her, strange garments of mundane dwellers. At this point, Sola returned with our meager, meager belongings and her young Martian protege, who of course would have to share the quarters with them. Sola asked us if we had had a visitor during her absence and seemed much surprised when we answered in the negative. It seemed that she had mounted the approach to the upper floors where our quarters were located. She had met Sarkozia descending. We decided that she must have been eavesdropping, but as we could recall nothing of importance that had passed between us, we dismissed the matter as of little consequence merely promising ourselves to be warned to the utmost caution in the future. Deja Thoris and I then fell to examining the architecture and decorations of the beautiful chambers of the building we were occupying. 
She told me that these people had presumably flourished over a hundred thousand years before. They were the early progenitors of her race, but had mixed with the other great race of early Martians, who were very dark, almost black, and also with the reddish-yellow race, which had flourished at the same time. These three great divisions of the higher Martians had been forced into a mighty alliance as the drying up of the Martian seas had compelled them to seek the comparatively few and always diminishing fertile areas and to defend themselves under new conditions of life against the wild hordes of green men. Ages of close relationship and intermarrying had resulted in the race of red men, which Dejah Thoris was a fair and beautiful daughter. During the ages of hardship, and incessant warring between their own various races, as well as with the green men, and before they had fitted themselves to the changed conditions, much of the high civilization and many of the arts of the fair-haired Martians had become lost. But the red race of today had reached a point where it feels that it had made up in new discoveries and in more practical civilization for all that lies irretrievably buried with the ancient Barsoomians beneath the countless intervening ages. These ancient Martians had been a highly cultivated and literary race, but during the vicissitudes of those trying centuries of readjustment to new conditions, not only did their advancement and production cease entirely, but practically all their archives, records, and literature were lost. Dejah Thoris related many interesting facts and legends concerning this lost race of noble and kindly people. She said that the city in which we were camping was supposed to have been a center of commerce and culture known as Korad. It had been built upon a beautiful natural harbor landlocked by magnificent hills. The little valley on the west front of the city, she explained, was all that remained of the harbor. All the paths through the hills to the old sea bottom had been the channel through which the shipping passed up to the city's gates. <clears throat> the shores of the ancient seas were dotted with just such cities and lesser ones in diminishing numbers. We were to be found converging towards the center of the oceans, as the people had found it necessary to follow the receding waters until necessity had forced upon them their ultimate salvation, the so-called Martian canals. We had been so engrossed in exploration of the building and in our conversation that it was late in the afternoon before we realized it. We were brought back to the realization of our present conditions by a messenger bearing a summons from Morquas Putmel, directing me to appear before him forthwith, bidding Deja Thoris and Sola farewell, and commanding Wula to remain on guard, I hastened to the audience chamber, where I found Morquas Putmel and Tars Tarkas seated upon the rostrum. prisoner with power. As I entered and saluted Lorquas Patmel, signaled me to advance and fixing his great hideous eyes upon me, addressed me thus. You have been with us a few days, yet during that time you have by your prowess won a high position among us. Be that as it may, you are not one of us. You owe us no allegiance. Your position is a peculiar one, he continued. You are a prisoner, and yet you give commands which must be obeyed. You are an alien, and yet you are a Tharkian chief. You are a midget, and yet you can kill a mighty warrior with one blow of your fist. And now you are reported to have been plotting to escape with another prisoner of another race. A prisoner who, from her own admission, half believes you are returned from the Valley of Dor. Either one of these accusations, if proved, 
would be sufficient grounds for your execution. But we are just people, and you shall have a trial on our return to Thark, if Tal Harjus so commands. But, he continued, in his fierce guttural tones, if you run off with the red girl, it is I who shall have to account to Tal Harjus. It is I who shall have to face Tars Tarkas, and either demonstrate my right to command, or the metal from my dead carcass will go to a better man, for such is the custom of Tharks. I have no quarrel with Tars Tarkas. Together we rule supreme the greatest of the lesser communities among the green men. We do not wish to fight between ourselves. And so, if you were dead, John Carter, I should be glad. Under two conditions only, however, may you be killed by us without orders from Tal Harjus. In personal combat, in self-defense, should you attack one of us, or were you apprehended in an attempt to escape? As a matter of justice, I must warn you that we only await one of these two excuses for ridding ourselves of so great a responsibility. The safe delivery of the Red Girl to Tal Harjus is the greatest importance. Not in a thousand years have the Tharks made such a capture. She is the granddaughter of the greatest of the Red Jeddaks, who is also our bitterest enemy. I have spoken. The Red Girl told us that we were without the softer sentiments of humanity, but we are a just and truthful race. You may go. Turning, I left the audience chamber. So this was the beginning of Sarkoja's persecution. I knew that none other could be responsible for this report which had reached the ears of Lorquas Potmel so quickly. And now I recalled those portions of our conversation which had touched upon escape and upon my origin. Sarkoja was at this time Tars Tarkas' oldest and most trusted female. As such, she was a mighty power behind the throne, for no warrior had the confidence of Lorquas Potmel to such an extent as did his ablest lieutenant Tars Tarkas. However, instead of putting our thoughts of possible escape from my mind, my audience with Lorquas Putmel only served to center my every faculty on this subject. Now, more than before, the absolute necessity for escape, insofar as Deja Thoris was concerned, was impressed upon me, for I was convinced that some horrible fate awaited her at the headquarters of Tal Harjus. As described by Sola, this monster was the exaggerated personification of all the ages of cruelty, ferocity, and brutality from which he had descended. Cold, cunning, and calculating. He was also, in marked contrast to most of his fellows, a slave to that brute passion, which the waning demands for procreation upon their dying planet has almost stilled in the Martian beast. The thought that the divine Deja Thoris might fall into the clutches of such an abysmal atavism started the cold sweat upon me. Far better that we save friendly bullets for ourselves at the last moment, as did those brave frontier women of my lost land, who took their own lives rather than fall into the hands of the Indian braves. As I wandered about the plaza, plaza Lost in my gloomy foreboding, forebodings, Tars Tarkas approached me on his way from the audience chamber. His demeanor towards me was unchanged, and he greeted me as though we had not just parted a few moments before. Where are your quarters, John Carter? he asked. I have selected none, I replied. It seemed best that I quartered either by myself or among the other warriors, and I was awaiting an opportunity to ask your advice. As you know, and I smiled, I am not yet familiar with all the customs of the Tharks. Come with me, he directed, 
and together we moved off across the plaza to a building which I was glad to see adjoined that occupied by Sola and her charges. My quarters are on the first floor of this building, he said, and the second floor is also fully occupied by warriors, but the third floor and the floors above are vacant. You may take your choice of these. I understand, he continued, that you have given up your woman to the Red Prisoner. Well, as you have said, your ways are not our ways, but you can fight well enough to do about as you please. And so, if you wish to give your woman to a captive, it is your own affair. But as a chieftain, you should have those to serve you. And in accordance with our customs, you may select any or all the females from the retinues of the chieftains whose medal you now wear. I thanked him, but assured him that I could get along very nicely without assistance, except in the matter of preparing food. And so he promised to send women to me for this purpose, and also for the care of my arms and the manufacture of my ammunition, which he said would be necessary. I suggested that they might also bring some of the sleeping silks and furs which belonged to me as spoils of combat, for the nights were cold and I had none of my own. He promised to do so and departed. Left alone, I ascended the winding corridor to the upper floors in search of suitable quarters. The beauties of the other buildings were repeated in this, and as usual, I was soon lost in a tour of investigation and discovery. I finally chose a front room on the third floor, because this brought me nearer to Deja Thoris, whose apartment was on the second floor of the adjoining building, and it flashed upon me that I could rig up some means of communication whereby she might signal me in case she needed either my services or my protection. Adjoining my sleeping apartment were baths, dressing rooms, and other sleeping and living apartments. In all, some 10 rooms on this floor. The windows of the back rooms overlooked an enormous court, which formed the center of the square made by the buildings which faced the four contiguous streets, and which was now given over to the quartering of the various animals belonging to the warriors occupying the adjoining buildings. While the court was entirely overgrown with yellow moss-like vegetation, which blankets practically the entire surface of Mars, yet numerous fountains, statuary, benches, and pergola-like contraptions bore witness to the beauty which the court must have presented in bygone times. When graced by the fair-haired, laughing people whom stern and unalterable cosmic laws had driven not only from their homes, but from all, except the vague legends of their descendants. <clears throat> One could easily picture the gorgeous foliage of the luxuriant Martian vegetation, which once filled this scene with life and color, the graceful figures of the beautiful women, the straight and handsome men, the happy frolicking children, all sunlight, happiness, and peace. It was difficult to realize that they had gone down through the ages of darkness, cruelty, and ignorance until their hereditary instincts of culture and humanitarianism had risen ascendant once more in the final composite race which now is dominant upon Mars. My thoughts were cut short by the advent of several young females bearing loads of silks, weapons, furs, jewels, cooking utensils, and casks of food and drink, including considerable loot from the aircraft. All this, it seemed, had been the property of the two chieftains I had slain, and now, by the custom of the Tharks, it had become mine. At my direction, they placed the stuff in one of the back rooms and then departed, only to return with a second load, which they advised me constituted the balance of my goods. On the second trip, they were accompanied by 10 or 15 other women and youths who it seemed formed the retinues of the two chieftains. They were not their families, nor their wives, nor their servants. The relationship was peculiar and so unlike anything known to us that it is most difficult to describe. 
All property among the Green Martians is owned in common by the community, except the personal weapons, ornaments, and sleeping silks and furs of the individuals. These alone can one claim undisputed right to, nor may he accumulate more than these than are required for his actual needs. The surplus he holds merely as custodian, and it is passed on to the younger members of the community as necessary. The women and children of a man's retinue may be likened to a military unit for which he is responsible in various ways, as in matters of instruction, discipline, sustenance, and the exigencies of their continual roamings and their unending strife with other communities and the Red Martians. His women are in no sense wives. The Green Martians use no word corresponding in meaning with this earthly word. Their mating is a matter of community interest solely, and is directed without reference to natural selection. The Council of Chieftains of each community control the matter as surely as the owner of a Kentucky racing stud directs the scientific breeding of his stock for the improvement of the whole. In theory, it may sound well, as is often the case with theories, but the result of ages of this unnatural practice coupled with the community interest in the offspring being held paramount to that of the mother it is shown in the cold, cruel creatures and their gloomy, loveless, mirthless existence. It is true that the Green Martians are absolutely virtuous, both men and women, with the exception of such degenerates as Tall Harches but better far a finer balance of human characteristics, even at the expense of a slight and occasional loss of chastity. Finding that I must assume responsibility for these creatures whether I would or not, I made the best of it and directed them to find quarters on the upper floors, leaving the third floor to me. One of the girls I charged with the duties of my simple cuisine and directed the others to take up various activities which had formerly constituted their vocations. Thereafter, I saw little of them, nor did I care to. Love making on Mars. Following the battle with the airships, the community remained within the city for several days, abandoning the homeward march until they could feel reasonably assured that the ships would not return. For to be caught on the open plains with a cavalcade of chariots and children was far from the desire of even so warlike a people as the Green Martians. During our period of inactivity, Tars Tarkas had instructed me in many of the customs and arts of war familiar to the Tharks, including lessons in riding and guiding the great beasts which bore the warriors. These creatures, which are known as Thoats, are as dangerous and vicious as their masters, but when once subdued are sufficiently tractable for the purposes of the Green Martians. Two of these animals had fallen to me from the warriors whose metal I wore, and in a short time I could handle them quite well as, a native, as the native warriors. The method was not at all complicated if the thoats did not respond with sufficient celerity to the telepathic instructions of their riders, they were dealt with. They were dealt a terrific blow between the ears with the butt of a pistol. And if they showed fight, this treatment was continued until the brutes either were subdued or had unseated their riders. In the latter case, it became a life and death struggle between the man and the beast. If the former were quick enough, with his pistol, he might live to ride again upon some other beast. If not, his torn and mangled body was gathered up by his women and burned in accordance with Tharkian custom. My experience with Wula determined me to attempt the experiment of kindness in my treatment of my thoats. First I taught them that they could not unseat me, and even wrapped them sharply between the ears to impress upon them my authority and mastery. And then by degrees, I won their confidence in much the same manner as I had adopted countless times with my many mundane mounts. 
I was ever a good hand with animals and by inclination, as well as because it brought more lasting and satisfactory results. I was always kind and humane in my dealings with the lower orders. I could take a human life if necessary, with far less compunction than that of a poor, unreasoning, irresponsible brute. In the course of a few days, my thoughts were the wonder of the entire community. They would follow me like dogs, rubbing their great snouts against my body in awkward evidence of affection, and respond to my every command with an alacrity and docility which caused the Martian warriors to ascribe to me the possession of some earthly power unknown on Mars. How have you bewitched them, said Tars Tarkas one afternoon, when he had seen me run my arm far between the great jaws of one of my thoats, which had wedged a piece of stone between two of his teeth while feeding upon the moss-like vegetation within our courtyard. By kindness, I replied, you see, Tars Tarkas, the softer sentiments have their value, even to a warrior. In the height of battle, as well as upon the march, I know that my thoughts will obey my every command, and therefore my fighting efficiency is enhanced, and I am a better warrior for the reason that I am a kind master. Your other warriors would find it to the advantage of themselves as well, as of the community to adopt my methods in this respect. Only a few days since you yourself told me that these great brutes, by the uncertainty of their tempers, often were the means of turning victory into defeat, since at a crucial moment they might elect to unseat and rend their riders. Show me how you accomplish these results, was Tars Tarkas' only rejoinder. And so I explained as carefully as I could the entire method of training I had adopted with my beasts. And later, he had me repeat it before, before Lorquas Potmel and the assembled warriors. That moment marked the beginning of a new existence for the poor thoats. And before I left the community of Lorquas Potmel, I had the satisfaction of observing a regiment of as tractable and docile mounts as one might care to see. The effect on the precision and celerity of the military movements was so remarkable that Lorquas Potmel presented me with a massive anklet of gold from his own leg, as a sign of his appreciation for my service to the Horde. On the seventh day, following the battle with the aircraft, we again took up the march towards Thark all probability of another attack being deemed remote by Lerquis Potmel. During the days just preceding our departure, I had seen but little of Dejah Thoris, as I had been kept very busy by Tars Tarkas with my lessons in the art of Martian warfare, as well as the training of my thoughts. The few times I had visited her quarters, she had been absent, walking upon the streets with Sola, or investigating the buildings in the near vicinity of the plaza. I had warned them against venturing far from the plaza for fear of the great white apes, whose ferocity I was only too well acquainted with. However, since Wula accompanied them on all their excursions, and as Sola was well armed, there was comparatively little cause for fear. On the evening before our departure, I saw them approach along one of the great avenues which led into the plaza from the east. I advanced to meet them, and telling Sola that I would take responsibility for Dejah Thora's safekeeping, I directed her to return to her quarters on some trivial errand. I liked and trusted Sola, but for some reason I desired to be alone with Dejah Thoris, who represented to me all that I had left behind upon earth in agreeable and congenial companionship. There seemed bonds of mutual interest between us as powerful as though we had been born under the same roof rather than upon different planets, hurtling through space some 48 million miles apart. She shared my sentiments in this respect, I was positive, for on my approach, the look of the pit pitiful hopelessness left her sweet countenance to be replaced by a smile of joyful welcome, 
as she placed her little right hand upon my left shoulder in true Red Martian salute. Sarkoja told Sola that you had become a true Thark, she said, and that I would now see no more of you than any of the other warriors. Sarkoja is a liar of the first magnitude, I replied, notwithstanding the proud claim of the Tharks to absolute verity. Deja Thoris laughed. I knew that even though you became a member of the community, you would not cease to be my friend. A warrior may change his metal, but not his heart, as the saying is upon Barzoom. I think they have been trying to keep us apart, she continued. For whenever you have been off duty, one of the older women of Tars Tarkas retinue has always arranged to trump up some excuse to get Sola and me out of sight. They have me down in the pits below the buildings, helping them mix their awful radium powder and make their terrible projectiles. You know that these have to be manufactured by artificial light, as exposure to sunlight always results in an explosion. You have noticed that their bullets explode when they strike an object? Well, the opaque outer coating is broken by the impact, exposing a glass cylinder almost solid in the forward end of which is a minute particle of radium powder. The moment the sunlight, even though diffused, strikes this powder, it explodes with a violence which nothing can withstand. If you ever witness a night battle, you will note the absence of these explosions. While the morning following the battle will be filled at sunrise with sharp detonations of exploding missiles fired preceding the preceding night. As a rule, however, non-exploding projectiles are used at night. While I was much interested in Deja Thoris's explanation of this wonderful adjunct to Martian warfare, I was more concerned by the immediate problem of their treatment of her. If they were keeping her away from me was not a matter for surprise, but that they should subject her to dangerous and arduous labor filled me with rage. Have they ever subjected you to cruelty and ignominy, Deja Thoris, I asked, feeling the hot blood of my fighting ancestors leap in my veins as I awaited her reply. Only in little ways, John Carter, she answered, nothing that can harm me outside of my pride. They know that I am the daughter of 10,000 Jeddaks, but I trace my ancestry back without a break to the builder of the first great waterway, and they, who do not even know their own mothers, are jealous of me. At the heart, they hate their horrid fates, and so wreak their poor spite on me who stand for everything they have not, and for all they most crave and never can attain. Let us pity them, my chieftain, for even though we die at their hands, we can afford them pity, since we are greater than they and they know it. I had known the significance of those words, my chieftain, as applied by a red Martian woman to a man. I should have had the surprise of my life, but I did not know at the time, nor for many months thereafter. Yes, I still had much to learn upon Barzoom. I presume it is the better part of wisdom that we bow to our fate with a good grace, as good grace is as possible, Deja Thoris. But I hope nevertheless that I may be present the next time that any Martian, green, red, pink, or violet, has the temerity to even so much as frown on you, my princess. Deja Thoris caught her breath at my last words, then gazed upon me with dilated eyes and quickening breath, and then, with an odd little laugh which brought roguish dimples to the corners of her mouth, she took her head and cried. What a child, a great warrior, and yet stumbling little child, what, what have I done now? I asked in sore perplexity. Someday you shall know, John Carter, if we live, but I may not tell you. And I, the daughter of Mors Kajak, son of Tardos Mors, have list, listened without anger, she soliloquized in con conclusion. 
Then she broke out again into one of her gay, happy, laughing moods, joking with me on my prowess as a Thark warrior, as contrasted with my soft heart and natural kindliness. I presume that you should accidentally wound an enemy. You would take him home and nurse him back to health, she laughed. That is precisely what we do on Earth, I answered, at least among civilized men. This made her laugh again. She could not understand it, for with all her tenderness and womanly sweetness, she was still a Martian, and to a Martian the only good enemy is a dead enemy. For every dead foeman means so much more to divide those who live. I was very curious to know what I had said or done to cause her so much perturbation a moment before, and so I continued to importune her to enlighten me. No, she exclaimed, it is enough that you have said it and that I have listened, and when you learn, John Carter, and if I be dead, as likely I shall be ere the moon has circled Barzoom another twelve times, remember that I listened and that I smiled. It was all Greek to me, but the more I begged her to explain, the more positive became her denials of my request, and so in very hopelessness I desisted. Day had now given away to night, and as we wandered along the great avenue lighted by the two moons of Barsoom, and with earth looking down upon us, out of her luminous green eyes, it seemed that we were alone in the universe, and I, at least, was content that it should be so. The chill of the Martian night was upon us, and removing my silks, I threw them across the shoulders of Dejah Thoris. As my arm rested for an instant upon her, I felt a thrill pass through every fiber of my being, such as contact with no other mortal had even produced. And it seemed to me that she had leaned slightly toward me, but of that I was not sure. Only I knew that as my arm rested there across her shoulders longer than the act of adjusting the silk required, she did not draw away, nor did she speak. And so in silence we walked the surface of a dying world, but in the breast of one of us at least had been born that which is ever oldest, yet ever new. I loved Dejah Thoris. The touch of my arm upon her naked shoulder had spoken to me in words I would not mistake, and I knew that I had loved her since the first moment that my eyes had met hers that first time in the plaza of the dead city of Korad.